I do clinical registry work at UC Davis. I'm, I also work with Ken Kaiser at the Institute for Population uh, Health Improvement um, as a senior scientist there. And, but I'm most famously known by what Don Detmer once called the world's only informed mortician <laughs> because of the California Electronic Medi uh, Death Registration System. So I won't talk about that today. So what will I talk about? Blue sky and, and registries. So we were asked to speak about blue sky ideas. So the idea here is next generation registries. And it started with the idea of this, the standard traditional surveillance registries, uh, the one we have that runs uh, out of IPHI for the California Department of Public Health is a Cal California cancer registry, one of the, I think one of the best cancer registries in the world. Um, and the idea was uh, when EHR adoption is broad, um, maybe over 70%, what should or could we do to provision data for these registries? Should we do things differently? And I think we obviously should, and we obviously can, but what else can happen? So that's what I'll talk about briefly today. So registries today are anything but blue sky. Um, case ascertainment takes a significant amount of time just understanding who got a cancer. It takes two years to three years. <coughs> Daniel's the data is manually abstracted. Uh, even from EHRs today, we have had an epic installation for eight years and my cancer registrar um, abstracts data out of the EPIC chart, and in fact, it's harder than the paper chart. Flipping pages on a screen is much slower than on a paper chart. It's not very well organized for the kind of things that she needs to do. Data is often incomplete because if she can't find something like ERPR status, it's left blank. And we all know about various flavors of null. So if, did you look and didn't find it? Was it not done? Who knows? And in fact, it was done. They were referred from an outside facility and it was done in an outside facility, so it's not my lab system. It's somewhere buried in a note saying it's ERPR positive. Um, also very difficult to find. Assembling data includes identification of duplicates and linking the same patient across multiple institutions that have reported information about this patient. That is a significant undertaking by the California Cancer Registry. And then because of all this, cost is very, very high and data quality is not commensurate with the effort. Um, hundreds of millions across institutions, and you just replicate that across the number of registries and the number of states. Um, I, I run out of zeros very quickly in terms of cost. So what can we do? And are they of value? Um, surveillance is what I mentioned here. That's traditional. You can use them to measure quality of care. And now I'm talking about not just surveillance registries, the kind that you see in public health, but every institution, I believe, will have one or more um, registries, um, and then clinical research, of course, understanding disease, improving diagnosis and treatment. But maybe they also have other value. Can they help improve care? So that's something I was never really contemplated, but the first thing I thought when I saw the cancer registry data was, wow, if I saw that patient, I'd really want to know that record. And then I said, can, can you do that? And they go, no, we're not allowed to do that. The statute doesn't allow it. The law says we can't. Not because of privacy, but because of the cost involved. They're meant to be a surveillance registry, which they do very well. They're not supposed to participate in clinical care. So I thought, well, that's not great. So that may be something we can change. So a significant amount of care also is fragmented across multiple providers. This is particularly true for cancer. So a cancer doctor would really want to see all that data, particularly if they're seeing the patient again, or maybe a recurrence. A complete view of the patient's record requires assembling all these slices together from all these providers. Does this theme kind of ring a bell? Health information exchange people? If registry data is high quality, complete, and timely, it should improve coordination of care. So if you can assemble this and put it in a place that providers can see it, and then it goes off to the registry, that would help coordination of care. I don't know that this concept has been discussed anywhere. I haven't seen papers about it. A blue sky idea, maybe it's, um, fantasy, I don't know, but we're going to try. So that's what's behind Project Inspire, we call it, <coughs> Interoperability to Support Practice Improvement, Disease Registries, and Care Coordination. So it's about acquisition and exchange of patient data in a high impact condition. So, and I'll talk a little bit about kind of our approach here. Um, the two initiatives that came out of this, um, and uh, hopefully at the end you'll understand why we did these two, is data capture and exchange for next generation registries. We want to demonstrate point of care data, uh, data uh, acquisition uh, in a structured fashion that supports clinical care and next generation registries. And then demonstrate the use of disease focused data exchange. So think of it as a cancer focused CCD 
or a CACCD, and I can tell you the CCD today doesn't really do or package all the data we need if you want a longitudinal record on somebody. So it's just the thought. And then the health information home, this idea of kind of a pre-registry <clears throat> repository of data. It's patient-centered because if you're the patient, this is how you view your record. You're getting it from all these people and you've assembled it in one place. It's not an institutional view and I think that's a problem. We've always viewed things from an institutional perspective. Even in my institution, I run the registries. The aha moment came when we did an ACO experiment with uh, Blue, Blue Shield and I got all their claim data and I thought, oh wow. I, we didn't have three quarters of the data on these patients and I think Mark mentioned this earlier, but the health plans have a lot of data. Um, and uh, so if you take the patient center view, it really isn't an institutional view of the record. It's assembling all of the institutional slices together. Um, and then contribute and, cons uh, and the health information home is data that can be contributed and consumed by community providers. So that's, that's the idea. So our overall approach, maybe this is, you know, the 10, le uh, I don't know how many lessons, uh, this is what we've learned along the way. Whatever you do, make it simple. Has to work today. Make it repeatable across diseases, vendors, and organizations. Hmm. Invent little, borrow a lot. Have an immediate starting point that's clinically relevant and have a roadmap to the future. So have a starting point that's practical, but also make sure there's a roadmap to the future. Start by focusing on a single high impact disease, which we've done. We focused on breast cancer. Partner with a community that's focused on that disease and willing to undertake culture change, because this is as much about culture change as it is about tech stuff. And so we've partnered with Athena, which is a breast health network, and I'll describe it briefly. And then partner with standards organizations right out the gate and policymakers to broaden what we develop. Make sure they understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and if they want to leverage it or take advantage of it, great. So we, in our uh, group, we have Mark Schafferman who works with us, who's been a member of HL7 from the beginning, has been its chair uh, uh, at least once, and um, we also work with IHE, and now we've started to work with ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, as well as the College of American Pathology. And then share, 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 be transparent, show vendors and others what we're doing. This shouldn't be a secret to vendors. We want you to do this. So this shouldn't be something that we only dole out to small, small uh, number of vendors. So one of the conclusions we came to very quickly was it all starts with good data capture. So, you know, you can't make great landscapes out of landfill, you know, which is kind of what we have. We have a data landfill today and it's not going to get better unless we have better data capture. So part of that is structured data capture. I'm a clinician. That, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. But it's a start. So I can show you kind of our approach. The first thing I, I happened when I talked to the, uh, my colleagues about this, and pathologists, radiologists, et cetera, was they just shook their heads and said, I'm not going to double enter anything. And I said, well, maybe we can meet in the middle. You don't double ever enter everything, but you enter key pieces of data, key points in the care process. So our approach is that. Ask providers to enter structured data for key data elements only. They do it in electronic forms or templates at key points of care. Think of it as a checklist, like when you're flying an airplane. They could have used one recently in San Francisco. Data is used for structured sharing and exchange after that. So we can then take this data that's very structured and then provide it back out using packages that actually can contain all the data and do it um, across, for example, episodes of care, um, like in a treatment summary or treatment plan. So like I said, we like to borrow good ideas. Some call it stealing. We call it leveraging. It's borrowing great ideas. So the CAP actually has something called electronic checklists. And I mention that because you'll see later on, we've used a similar approach for questionnaires. They basically have an XML schema for rendering a, essentially a data capture form. And they've worked with vendors already, with Epic and Cerner, and I believe SunQuest, to implement this for synoptic reporting and pathology. IHE also has, has a, a specification for retrieve form for data capture. And of course, a lot of you probably know about the remote data capture initiative the SNI framework has started. So um, we, uh, we're borrowing a lot of that stuff. And uh, we also are borrowing this idea that ASCO and HL7 collaborated on called the Clinical Oncology Treatment Plan and Summary. And if you couple that with the um, CDC's CDA for registry submission of cancer data, 
I think we may start getting close to this idea of a longitudinal record CDA, where I can package a longitudinal record as a CDA, and that gets put in a longitudinal repository. I haven't seen that yet. I believe, and I've been told, that CDA can do this using reusable extensions. So the Athena Breast Health Network, culture change. So uh, we have about 200 providers across the five UCs, and now we've uh, added Sanford, not Stanford, but Sanford in the Midwest. Um, and uh, we've put in for a grant from PCORI to add Native American tribe uh, healthcare systems as well as LA County, if they're willing, um, uh, to do this. Uh, and we'll be basically, uh, uh, Athena is about collecting data from women, most of them healthy, and also cancer uh, patients, breast cancer patients, to improve screening and detection, do comparative effectiveness, patient engagement, and hopefully actually do prevention, um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, improve biomarkers as well as therapy. So we have three cohorts, screening, prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship. Uh, we have 50,000 already signed up. They've all filled out um, health questionnaires, and I'll show you how they did that and why the tie-in, why, why there's more of a tie-in than just the community. We actually built an XML-based questionnaire system, so it renders the XML on the fly, and we, the XML schema supports questionnaires. So isn't a form really just a simple questionnaire? Turns out the questionnaires we do are a lot more complicated than the synoptic reports that I saw CAP trying to do. Um, so we're all in this doing the same thing with the same methodology, yet we're coming up with different XML schemas. So we should harmonize that, and that's what we're talking about. We actually built the system, it's in play. Uh, patients actually get invitations, they fill out the questionnaire online uh, in an online system that has rendered the XML. They also uh, can fill it out in an iPad in the clinic, and the survey is not hard-coded in the iPad, it actually comes as an XML form which is rendered in the <coughs> iPad with skip logic and everything. And this is all structured data entry. What you can do with that is drive something that you see at the bottom, that actually is something called breast health decision. It's a decision support tool that we have and we use. It automatically adjusts uh, risk and other statistics and presents them to the patient and the doctor in an easy to understand form and it's in the right context. And we do that because we have structured data to do that with. So what are we planning to do today for a project Athena that's part of Inspire, we call it Athena Inspire is uh, really deliver to the EHR through what we call web iframe are essentially Athena questionnaire but for providers and, um, and, and uh, our survey system does run on the cloud, it runs on Salesforce, it's already running, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that and then we're going to output the thing as um, something we call CACCD and from that you'll derive the CDCCDA and we're collaborating with the Cancer Registry, California Cancer Registry so they can compare the data that they receive on those cases with data that they're receiving through the traditional route and look at some of the things that, uh, um, uh, in terms of data quality, timeliness, et cetera, completeness. So this is not a replacement right now for that process. We're just setting this up and then gonna, and gonna understand how it works and what are the pain points and what are the benefits. The road to the future is, in, in our mind or in, my, in what we've discussed, is XML-based structured data capture would be something to think about and everybody's talked about XML-based data exchange, but it would be great to think about a standard for an XML form to be rendered in an EHR, just like the CAP has done for synoptic reporting. But not just synoptic reporting, think of structured data capture for key pieces of data throughout the data, throughout the, uh, the care of the patient, and by different providers, you know, radiation oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and then send that to what we call the health information home and then on to the registry. So what's the health information home? It's a kind of a new concept. We just sort of came up with it. This idea that it's really, it's kind of a pre-registry. So as I mentioned before, data from the cancer registry cannot be provided back out for clinical care purposes. We thought, well, that's okay. Let's have it stop before it gets to the registry. And the law doesn't deal with that. Um, and it's allowable. And in fact, it's a common practice among HIEs to do just that. Many of you who run HIEs have repositories of your own. And if you look at HealthBridge's website, they talk a lot about you doing that for analytic purposes and comparative effectiveness. So this is not a new theme, and I think it's going to happen more and more. But the purpose of this is simply to put, 
put it before the registry and then have a longitudinal record on the patient. Um, it's patient-centered, which means that one day maybe it can be patient-controlled. That was kind of the idea. So when, when we finally have patient identifiers, unambiguous identifiers that allow them to get out of this. Um, and then um, we're partnering with other organizations now. There are other uses for this. For example, foster children get fragmented care across you know, multiple providers when they go from home to home. So there's been an interest there, and we're collaborating with, with the Children's Partnership on a proposal there. And then there's also uh, the Physician Orders for Life-Sustained Treatment, which is a great idea. It's not available electronically in many places. EMT showed up. Grandma said, I don't want a tube in my throat. And guess what happens? They don't have that there. There's no no-code order. The EMTs or whoever has to do what they think is best. And sometimes that's not what the patient really desired. So we really need to have a place to put this. So this would be another natural place to put this. And then I want to mention just the, 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 the folks who were completely ignored, I think, almost completely ignored by the High Tech Act, but actually render a substantial amount of care. We, we don't think about them often, but those are long-term care, long care facilities. They didn't get any incentive money. What are they doing? And they need access to this stuff. So that's another place, another <coughs> provider in the community that might benefit from something like this. Um, and this is just a conceptual diagram, but basically EHR through a structured form into the health information exchange, moving that into a health information home from which you can do all these things, including sending it to the registry. So that's the idea. Um, I'm not going to take questions now. I'm going to just pass it on now to um, Clem McDonald, and uh, we'll take questions at the end. Okay. Thanks.